Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. Good morning. Glad you're here, and Merry Christmas to all of you. Yeah. I uh, hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I know um, many different traditions. How many of you open up presents tonight? Today's your, going to be your day. How many are tomorrow? Let's see. Yeah, we used to be Christmas Eve. My family growing up, we were Christmas Day. Uh, when I got married, we became Christmas Eve because I got married. And uh, now as, um, as times have changed and things have changed, uh, and our kids are raising kids, it's easier um, to do it on Christmas Day. So we do a little, kind of a little combination of both of those things. But um, yeah, however you celebrate we just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and pray it's your best, best Christmas uh, yet. We're in uh, a series called The King is Coming. That was what we did for Christmas, and it was twofold. We talked about the prophecies that the Bible lists very accurately, 1,500 years, 800 years, 700 years about the birth of Jesus. They tell us where he'll be born. They tell us what his name will be. Uh, they get into... Um, it's some uncanny things that you could say like, uh, well, that's pretty nebulous. These prophecies are not nebulous. They are right on and they are accurate and they are very personal. And so we looked at those at the birth of Jesus, but then I also connected it to, uh, and the reason we called it present tense, the king is coming because there are many prophecies that predict the return of Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords. The first time he came, as a suffering servant, as a baby entering into the world. When he returns, he will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so if we can trust the fact, because we can look and see those prophecies about his birth were accurate right down to the nth degree. They did not miss, and they did not miss on the details. If we can trust the Bible for that, then why couldn't we trust the Bible prophetically on his return a second time? And so we spent some time looking at that and talking about that, and Different pastors have helped in this, uh, Kate and Jake and Terry, and I appreciate what they've done. JJ, Pastor JJ, did a fantastic job. It would be reminisce for me to, um, I need to turn off my, <laughs> uh, my messaging. One of my buddies is here and says, wow, a suit twice a year, you look pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jason, I don't know where you are if you're watching from home, but that's not nice. So, <laughs> I got one in between service from a person in South Carolina who said, you clean up nice. So that's, that's nice. Um, yeah, yeah, God bless you. Um, <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was saying right there. It totally <laughs> threw me out. Uh, we're looking at Luke chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 14. It's the Christmas story. Now, um, probably uh, the two Gospels that give the most details about the birth of Jesus are Matthew and Luke. A little detail on Luke. Luke was not an eyewitness to what happened with Jesus. Luke was a doctor. He was a disciple of Paul, uh, a contemporary in that time. And Luke went back and interviewed people who were alive who saw it face to face. And like a doctor, he took fantastic notes. He was real thorough in how he did what he did. And I like Luke's presentation of it. Matthew's is great, but I like Luke's version of events. And so I'm gonna use Luke today 
uh, for our story. And then I'm going to show you a couple of things in the story that you, I bet chances are good. I won't say nobody ever saw it before, but I bet many of you haven't seen it. It's usually left out of the Christmas uh, story. And I think there's something in it for us today that you'll find interesting. So we're going to look at Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. I'll read it, comment, and then just pull a few things out to teach today. So it begins this way. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Remember, Rome was the power over all of that area at that time, the most powerful. Uh, this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this is a prophetic event coming into place. It was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, the meaning of Bethlehem in the Hebrew is house of bread. And remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The Bible has so many dual meanings if we understand scripture. Now, what makes this really uh, interesting, Jesus should have been born in Nazareth. That's his town. That's where he grew up. It would have been the natural place for him to be born. But prophetically, 700 years before his birth, it was predicted he would be born in Bethlehem. And in fact, prophetically, they said that's where the Messiah has to come from. Now, here's what's interesting in this. The way he ended up in Bethlehem from Nazareth was that the government called a census which required him to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The good news in that is God can use any government he wants to to do good things. I thought you'd have a better response to that. It should give us hope today for our government. Rome was anything but Christian and completely pagan. They didn't know God. They didn't love God. And in fact, for a time, they persecuted people who do know God. And God used this very ungodly government in order to fulfill prophecy. God can use whoever, whatever, whenever to do whatever he wants to do. The Bible tells us he uses all things to do good. All things. That means even things in your life that you can't figure out why they are the way they are. If you'll give it to God and let him take those things, God can win with a pair of tubes. Can win with a pair of tubes. That is a poker analogy that I threw in there just in case you were wondering. Uh, and because Joseph was, Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. So she's big and pregnant, and we know the story. She gives birth to Jesus uh, in Bethlehem. Now, um, most of us think of this story as taking place in a short amount of time. It couldn't have and didn't. The journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem is at least four days and more likely a week, depending on the condition of the person. And we have a person who is great with child, and you can't rush that right there. Yeah. And every one of your Christmas cards shows her on a donkey, and Joseph is leading the donkey. But there's not one place in Scripture that says she was on a donkey. And the matter of fact was, she was very poor, and the chances were, as a pregnant woman, she walked from Nazareth to Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, to Bethlehem. And that is a difficult thing right there. And then they have to take the census... And how long does it take a census? I mean, today we have modern tools and equipment. How long does it take our country to finish the census? Months. And they had to stay there until they were all counted. So she's there at, from a minimum of two weeks. She may be there for two months. And it's during that time that she conceives. Chances are, if she was close to birth while she was in Nazareth, she wouldn't have had to go. But because she was probably in her six or seven month, they thought it would be safe for her to go. So this is a long period of time. But the reason I bring this up, it all goes to fulfilling a prophecy that literally is 700 years old. All of these things had to come together to make it happen. It's amazing when you look at it. So because Joseph was a descendant of King David and had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient town, he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. 
That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were what? They were terrified. Every place in Scripture where you see an angel manifest, where, where the infinite comes into the finite, it's never this smooth, easy, unfrightening experience. And so when people relate like, hey, I saw an angel and we had Starbucks and he gave me a high five, I'm not sure what you saw, but I don't think it was an angel from heaven because I'm going to tell you the truth. Every place in scripture, old and new, when someone saw an angel, it was a frightening experience because it is heaven coming to earth. It is not normal. It is not natural. It is bigger than us. It is more powerful than us. And it enters our life in a way where we're like, whoa. And do you know that what most of humanity's response to an angel is? They fall on their face and they begin to worship an angel like it's God. And the angel has to stop them and say, no, I'm just an angel. You only worship God. So I'm just pointing out to you, these people are afraid. They are full of fear. And then the angel said, here's the message from heaven. I bring you good news that will be great joy to who? All All people. That doesn't mean just Jewish people. That doesn't mean white people. It means black people. It means Muslim people. It means all people on the face of the earth. It's good news. People who love him, people who don't love him, people who know him, people who don't know him. God's message to humanity is, I love you. And that's good news, and you should be excited because that message could have gone the other way. I bring you bad tidings of great terror, which is to all people today. God is upset. How would that message go across? It would fit with being terrified, yes or no? The message from heaven is that God loves you. He doesn't want you to be afraid. Let's finish the story. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host. That word means tens upon tens of thousands. This isn't a choir like we had. This is a choir of epic proportions that filled the sky. These aren't the angels that you see during the month of February when we're celebrating Valentine's Day and they're shooting each other naked with little bows and arrows. These aren't those angels. This is the host of heaven, God's army. One angel in the Bible destroyed 180,000 people. This is not, this is terrifying, it's monstrous, it's huge. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of heaven, of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is what? He's pleased. We hadn't even done anything to be pleasing to him. And he's pleased with us. How about that? It's an important message. I think the first thing that I put in my messages to teach on real quickly, the message from heaven is don't be afraid. What a message that is today. How much fear is in our society? I am reading just this week, the level of suicide is higher than it's ever been among teenagers and 20 somethings. That is a scary fact for a pastor. I wonder sometimes, is the church even making a difference in the world where it needs to make a difference? Upon those who know him, yes, but how many people don't even know that God loves them and cares and in their life never knowing that God had a plan and a purpose for them? I hate that. That's not a Christmas message. That's your pastor's heart coming out. But don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. I love that. Let me, uh, let me flip the coin on this with the recent conversation that I had. Now, I'm not going to reveal if it was a man or a woman or exactly all of the details, but I had a person come up to me uh, after service and said, why is it this church more hellfire and brimstone? Yes, hellfire and brimstone. Why don't you preach more about hell? 
and I listen to the person calmly and I listen to the person interestingly with my heart open. Maybe I'm wrong about something. Maybe they need to teach me something. But as I listened, what I heard was a lot of fear was coming and the person ended the conversation by telling me, I would like to invite people here, but you're not gonna scare them enough so that they end up going to heaven and avoiding hell. So let me ask you a question. Is that why you came to Jesus, because you were afraid, or did you connect to the idea that he loved you and had a purpose and plan for your life? Everything I read in the Bible is God telling us, my message to you is, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Now, pastor, do you believe in a hell? If there's a heaven, there has to be a hell. There's a doctrine on that that I don't have time to teach right now. But my question to you is, is the reason to come to Jesus to escape hell or is it to be with him in eternity? But the difference in that is life and death. And sometimes you can't get that through to people. Let me give you another scripture that helps to prove this. The very first time that Jesus ministered publicly, he was handed the, the, the Old Testament. Because remember, there is no New Testament. He's the New Testament. And it'll be written about him later on. But he has handed the scrolls from the Old Testament. He turns to Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah prophesied a lot about the coming of Messiah 700 years before Jesus was born. And here's the very first message Jesus preaches publicly. It's from Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring bad news. Do you read that? Hey, if you're visiting today, we're interactive. <laughs> Leah, welcome home. Thanks. Good to see you. Yes, just got back from Paris. Welcome home. Welcome home from Vegas. It's old home week this week. Yeah. Wow, good to see you. Um, the very first message that Jesus preaches, this is the starting point of what the gospel is. Gospel means good news. Listen to me. Gospel means good news, not bad news, not scary news, not almost good news, not pretty good news. The good news. Here's the good news. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of God's favor has come upon mankind. Yes or no, that is good news. You have messed up theology. If you see any other message first as being the message of Jesus, did Jesus teach on hell? Yes, but he taught far more on the kingdom of God than he taught on anything else. Repent for the kingdom of God is upon you. Enter into the kingdom of God. People have waited forever to see what you see today. This is what Jesus said. And now it's upon you. Rejoice. He said, when the prophets were here, you killed them because you didn't like their message. So the son of man comes eating and drinking and hanging out and restoring people. And you call him a drunkard. Yes. He said, you can't ever be happy with what God sends you. Hmm. God, the message of Christmas is just that. Don't be afraid. It's good news. Great joy for all people. How about this? God loves you so passionately and the proof is that he sent Jesus Christ into this world to let you know. Jesus is the revealed heart of God on the planet. It wasn't enough that it was written down in a text. He sent his son to this world to tell you how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, and how much he wants a relationship with you. You know what I've learned about relationships though? They're always two-sided, aren't they? Any relationship in this church, I don't care if you're married, I don't care if it's a significant other, I don't care if it's just a friend of yours, no relationship happens because only one person wants a relationship to happen. It takes two, yes or no. The day you wake up and somebody says, I don't want to be with you anymore, you can't make them do anything. The same thing is true. God has decided, Eric, he wants a relationship with you, but you have to in return say, I want a relationship back with you. It works that way. And to believe Jesus loves every person and died for every person's sin, but it's not applied unless you are a friend of God. Unless you say, 
I want you in my life. I accept you in my life. Now, when I say that, some people have a lot of preconceived, misconceived ideas, just like the one on hell that I talked about a few minutes ago. Some people believe that I'm talking about church. Well, what pastor's really saying is, as long as you go to church, you're a friend of God. It's not what I said. Some people think, well, I have to reform my life. I have to be good. I have to say certain prayers. I have to do certain things. I have to, do, I have to give a certain amount of money. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it this simply. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And if anybody hears me knocking and opens the door and wants me to come in, I will. They'll know me. I'll know them. That's two people. That's salvation. Does that make sense? It's a relationship not based on fear, but based totally on love. It's not a one-time thing that you pray this prayer and then you go your way. How about this? Chris and I celebrated our 40th anniversary last Sunday. 40 years. Stood right here with just a few of our family and a couple of friends, and we renewed our vows with each other. It was wonderful. It 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 was awesome. It was awesome. She... Yes, again and again and again and again for the rest of my life. That's the truth of the matter. But we entered into that relationship. Man, I didn't say in 1983, I do, and then I'm going to go my own way, and I'll see you when we get to heaven. What kind of a relationship would that be? Some of you were like, I'd like to try that relationship. Is there any, is there any place I can sign up for that? I, I, yeah, that, that's not a relationship. That's a solo act. It's a false commitment to a relationship or two people who say yes to each other and grow in that. God is not saying, hey, pray a prayer and then we're all good and I'll see you in heaven. God wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. Do you know the one scary scripture that I read? It's when Jesus meets with a group of people who think they're believers. And he says to them, get away from me because I don't know you. Know you. And they say, what? We prayed and we prophesied and we even cast out demons. And Jesus goes, but I don't know who you are. How could that be? It's what I described. They may have at one time acknowledged Jesus, but they lived their entire lives without him, thinking that's what a relationship is. A relationship is two people every day working on it, growing in it. Do you agree? Why are you like, yeah, that doesn't fly in 2023. And 2023 is as screwed up as it could be. There it is. Welcome to Jubilee on Christmas Eve. My name's Pastor John and I came to help you. Let me give you the second thing because I'm going to get stuck here on this. The Bible says in that story, we'll, reckon, we'll recognize him by this sign. So look at 2, 11 through 12. Uh, The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. Here's the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. All right, here's when I... I don't think normally you need a sign to tell you that somebody's a king. Now, if you look at someone like Prince Charles... The way he dresses tells you he's the king. Where he lives tells you he's the king. The way that people fawn all over him tell you he's the king. The jewels he has tells you he's the king, right? So I don't think normally you need a sign to have knowledge that that's the king. But in this case, there's a little bit of trouble. Because instead of looking for God to come as a baby into the world, all God but all man, instead of looking for him that way, people were looking for different things to identify a king. Israel was looking for a military leader who would come and overthrow Rome. That's why they had trouble. Even his disciples did not understand until the very end that he came to seek and save that what was lost, not to destroy Rome. They had trouble with that. King Herod, he was looking for a threat When the wise men came and went to Herod and said, hey, we saw his star in the east and we have come to worship the newborn king of the Jews. Herod was freaked out because he was the king of the Jews. It was an insult to his power and a threat. 
So he lies to the wise men. Hey, why don't you go and find him? And when you find him, come back and tell me where he is so I may go worship him too. He's lying to them. His real plan was to go and kill Jesus. And an angel had to tell the wise men, do not go back the way you came. Go back to Persia another way. And then he told Joseph, the angel told Joseph, you need to leave and go to Egypt. And then Herod, when he found out what was done, do you remember his response? He went in and killed every male child under the age of two surrounding Bethlehem. That was also a prophecy. That's wicked. That is wicked. Some today, the sign they're looking for, Santa Claus. What I mean by that is they want someone who will just give them stuff all the time. I kind of compare it to a father and a grandfather. When I was a father, I raised five children. I'm a much different father than I am a grandfather. As a father, I had to ter- worry about how they're going to turn out. Will they be good citizens? Will they be productive? Will they be normal? <laughs> I don't want them to grow up and be thieves. I don't want them to grow up and I don't want to see them on the news. Hey, there was a flash robbery and there's my two kids running out the store. Hey, I'm so proud of them. No, don't want that. So that means that we disciplined our children. Oh, ooh, be careful. Be careful. What did you do? Oh, wouldn't you like to know? I did what my mother did. I turned out okay. They turned out okay. Today you'd go to jail for it. <laughs> so as a parent, I was more strict. As a parent, my whole thing was... I want them to turn out with character. I want them to bear fruit. I want them to do right. So I was a different parent. But when I became a grandparent, Ezra, Milo, when I became a grandparent, oh my God, boys, have I ever had to correct you? Never. You don't even know what that means, do you, from me? What do I do? Give you candy? Give you toys? Take you wherever you want to go? We go get... Huh? Huh? Let you sit in the front, talk to you during the Christmas service. (laughs) I don't worry how you're going to turn out. Your mom and dad worry how you're going to turn out. I know you're going to turn out good. Some people want God to be a grandfather, and God's not a grandfather. He's a father. He's not a Santa Claus. God's job is not to just open up a big bag and dump toys on you and not worry how you turn out. He cares for your character. Does that make any sense? So some are looking for that, and then they get disappointed when they don't find it. Other people today aren't looking at all. They could care less. But here's what I like. Many people have been watching and have found the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They know who Jesus is. They recognize God's plan. They know that he's Emmanuel, God with us. He is Jesus, and it is the most wonderful thing in the world. Remember I told you in this message that there were two parts of it that always get left out to individuals a male and a female. The first one is a male named Simeon who follows this story about the birth of Jesus. After eight days, the Jewish tradition is the male child has to be taken and presented at the temple and it's also, um, it's when they do that thing that little Jewish boys have done to them. And if you don't know, ask on the way home because that's as far as I'm going with it right now. So the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, same chapter, part of the same story. Look at this real quick. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Important words, remember that. The Holy Spirit was with him and had revealed to him this fact. He would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him into the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. Look what he says here. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. 
It is such an obscure story. The reason it's left off is because most people don't know how to make sense of it. Let me tell you why it could make sense to you today. Two things it says about Simeon. One, he was led by the Holy Spirit to see Jesus. And two, the Lord kept him alive until it was possible for him to see salvation. So let me tell you something that the Lord would hear you, have you here today. One, the Holy Spirit led you here today. You think you got invited by a friend. You think you just show up for Christmas Eve services. You think it's all an accident. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is on your side, and you may or may not know it. The Holy Spirit is leading you. He is drawing you. He loves you. He's trying to reveal God's heart to you. And you are not here by accident today. You are here because the Holy Spirit wanted you to be here. Now let me go a little bit deeper and listen to this. The reason that many of you are alive today is because God kept you alive so that you could hear today that God loves you and cares for you. You are going to be okay until you hear this message. That doesn't mean you'll die this afternoon. It means he preserved your life. So I want to ask you this question. I want you to think about it. It can be rhetorical or you can answer. But how many of you should be dead right now? When you think over your life and the close calls you've had, things that you've done, mistakes you made, maybe it was an auto accident. You know the weird thing? There may be things that you don't even know that God got you out of the way so that you don't even know that he saved your life. I can tell you in my life, car accidents, literal car accidents, where the police said to me, how are you alive? How are you walking away from this? I don't know. I don't know is not a good answer. How about God's hand was on my life? How about God kept me? I'll tell you a weird story. My mom was in the first service. I didn't ask permission, but I know she said it's okay to share it before. Uh, she married a man who tried to kill her. Tried to feed her rat poison and did. She thought it was something else was in the hospital constantly. And it was the Lord himself who intervened and showed her what it was, and spared her life at the very last minute. Why? Because God had a plan for her and wasn't going to let the enemy take her out before the plan was put into effect. I'm telling you today, the Holy Spirit led you here and God kept you alive so that you have a chance to hear how much God loves you. And you won't open your eyes. I can stand here and say it and you won't open your eyes. How can it be like that? May God open your eyes today. Here's the other one, Anna. This is Luke 2, just right after Simeon. Luke 2, 36 and 38, two verses. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple the day they brought Jesus in. First, Simeon sees him. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years, so she was around 22 years old. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. That's a long time to live by yourself, yes or no? Look at this. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayers. She came along just as Simeon was taking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Why is this in there? First of all, I believe that God did this. These two people prayed for this opportunity and God made it happen for them and he put them for the rest of all the world to see that God answers people's prayers. They're very insignificant, but a very powerful moment. And I would encourage you to be like Anna in this way. That if you know this Jesus, don't keep your mouth closed. Tell everybody you know the life that you found. Why would you keep it to yourself if it's real and it's true? Tell everybody, man. If it's that good, it's as easy for me to stand up here and say that and teach this and talk about Jesus as it is to talk about the Broncos. May they do well this afternoon. <laughs> that really is the end of my message but it leads me to what the close is. I mentioned earlier, these three things I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt. Listen to me, no manipulation, no embarrassment, 
I'm not going to do anything weird to you. No one's going to follow you home. We're not extracting information from you. I'm not asking you if you want to join church. I'm not asking you if you want to reform. I'm not asking you if you need to change. I'm asking you, listen to the question, can you hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? I believe the Holy Spirit led you here today. I believe God preserved your life because he wants you to hear good news. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news. Great tidings of joy to all people. No matter where you are in life, God brings good news to you. In the city of David is born today a savior for all mankind. A relationship takes two people. Jesus died for every sin committed yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But it's only applied in your life when you say, I want a relationship with you. That's the truth. The gospel, the good news, is simple news. God loves you. He sent Jesus for you. And he wants you to say yes to a relationship. Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And if anyone hears me knocking and opens the door, I will come in. They will know me and I will know them. A relationship. Not a one-time prayer and then see in heaven. A relationship for the rest of your life. And for all eternity. I'm not asking you to leave your church. I won't embarrass you. Between you and God. Can you hear him pulling on your heart today? What Jesus did is worthy of a decision. It's not worthy to admire him from a distance or just to know about it. But to say yes to a relationship. And if you say, Pastor John, you're talking to me. I feel the Lord pulling at my heart. I feel him knocking at the door. Pastor, I want to open the door and I want to invite Christ into my life. I want him to be a part of my life. I want a relationship with him. I want his mercy. I want his grace. I want his forgiveness. I want his life. I want you to think about it. I don't want you to make an emotional decision. Again, I won't embarrass you. But I want to facilitate something between you and Jesus right now. So if you say, Pastor, that's what I want. I want to open my life to Jesus. I want the relationship with him. Pastor, please pray for me today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up real quick? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Yep. Yep. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. See you. Just leave it up long enough where I can see you. I'm not going to make you stay. I'm not going to embarrass you. See you, see you, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Yep. Anybody else? Thank you. If you wish you had raised your hand, do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm going to pray, but it's not my prayer that gets this done. It's yours from your heart. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer, and let's just make it easy. Can everybody just repeat after me? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for loving me, choosing me, knocking on the door of my heart. I open my life to you. 
yes to all that you want. Be merciful to me. Forgive me. Make me yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. The good news is, if you met that prayer, God heard that prayer and has already answered yes. The word actually says he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. And there's more celebration in heaven over a sinner who comes home than over all the church that just gathers today. Can you imagine that? It makes God that excited. Church, can we welcome those who have <laughs> said yes to Jesus today? Well, Chris and I wish you a Merry Christmas. I pray it's your best one yet. Not ever, but best one yet. Pray next year's even better. Looking forward to 2024. How about you? Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing. And we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.